So uh, this is a, a work with uh, Don Giman, who's now at, uh, at Johns Hopkins. Uh, basically, it's an extension of something we have been doing for years, and which was uh, initially on phase detection, and now we try to extend this to more complex uh, objects. So during my, I did my PhD with Don Giman. He was my advisor, and we designed uh, a new phase detector, which was based on uh, an idea of hier hierarchical decomposition of a pool space. So this is typically, so I don't know how familiar you are with uh, object detection in general and phase detection more specifically, but the idea of object detection is you want to design an algorithm that uh, if you give it a scene, so an image, uh, where an object is visible or one instance or a few instances of the subject, at the end you would get as an out output uh, locations of all the instances of the object. So for faces, you would expect to get usually uh, a location on the scale, uh, telling you where, where it is for every face. So in that case, we were going a bit further because we were able to estimate more accurately the, more accurately the location of the face. So more precisely for this algorithm, the output for every face would be the location of the eyes. And here I just display a small triangle uh, to show roughly where it is. But it's not an estimate of the location of the mouse. It's just the two eyes. So uh, the usual way of doing object detection consists of uh, passing the scene, so going through every location on every scale, and at every location on every scale to have a black box machine learning uh, able to answer the question, I is the object there or not? Okay, So you have this kind of algorithmic loop, which is outside, that goes through locations on, on, on scale, and for every single location scale, you, you ask your machine learning thing, is there a face, is there a face, is there a face, is there a face? So you have this external loop, going through uh, scale, and for every scale, going through locations, OK? And for the approach we proposed, which we call cost to find, the idea was to divide uh, what we call the post space. So now the task we need to solve is you, you give me a small image, for instance, 32 by 32, grayscale, let's say. And I just have to, to predict, so the machine learning part has to predict uh, a, bo a Boolean flag, if there is a face or not. but in that case, we wanted to go just a bit further, which is we wanted to know if there was a face and where is the location of the eyes. So the approach we proposed was to, to build a sequence of a hierarchical uh, family of classifiers. So here, you, this ellipse stands for the, what we call the pose space. So in that case, the pose is just location of the center between the eyes, so this point, the tilt, so the, the angle between the vertical going through the face and the vertical in the image on the scale, which is the distance between the eyes. So the pose is the set of those four parameters. And here, this stands for the, all the pose we want to catch in this small image. So we, we let the center of the eyes float into a small box, an 8 by 8 box, the tilt be to be between minus 20 and plus 20 degrees, and the scale to be between 8 and 16 pixels. And here you see the dispersion. Here I sample at random uniformly in this pose space poses, and I just display the eyes on the mouse location. And as you see, it's pretty uh, spread. But so we build a classifier, which is supposed to say one, to respond that there is something. Uh, as soon as there is a face, whatever it's posed, which is still in, in this ellipse, it's, it's, it's a pretty challenging task because you expect a lot of invariance from your classifier. But so we, we proposed uh, an, another idea, which is we will build this classifier with an extremely uh, conservative threshold. So it will react uh, so that it never misses a face. Of course, this detector will make a lot of false positives. But then if this guy says uh, there is a face, then we have a bunch, uh, a family of four other detectors which are dedicated to more constrained uh, poses. So now I every one of these ellipses, instead of uh, uh, being uh, the same constraint as, as before, now we force the center of the eyes to be in a small box of four by four instead of eight by eight. So it's why we have four detectors we are going to try. Is there a face with the center here? Is there a face with the center here, etc. So here you see that it, it constrains far more the location of the eyes on the mouse. And we go, we go down like this. So we split location on scale, on tilt, etc. But so the, the global idea is that we have this pose space where the, the pose can be, it can be anywhere. And we, we split it hierarchically and build a family of classifiers dedicated to subset of targets, of faces which are getting more and more complex. So at the end of this hierarchy, for instance, this ellipse, uh, you can see that it's extremely highly constrained. And now, of course, a classifier which is specifically uh, aiming at detecting faces with this pose 
is far easier to build because you don't expect the machine learning part to, to learn and to guess and to, to uh, invent the invariance which is in, in the data. Now, the only remaining invariance is due to almost independent random stuff. You don't have any more strong uh, long-term correlation due to the fact that there is this hidden variable which is opposed. So to summarize all this, we have this hierarchy of both cells and we build one classifier for each. And it, it worked pretty well. Um, sorry. It worked pretty well, but there is a strong drawback, which is that we need to build one classifier for every cell. And in the actual implementation we, we built, uh, we had more than 100 classifiers. And you need to feed those classifiers to train them with training sets which, very fee, which uh, are actually consistent with your post constraints. So for the phases, uh, that was easy because, because there is just translation, scale, and rotation. If you give me uh, an image of a face in a certain pose, I can synthesize an image of a, I can force the pose to be in any cell just by rotating it, scaling it, and translating. But in practice, uh, that would not be the case. You, you would need a lot of data. So maybe to put a bit this in context, uh, there have been a lot of work on object detection. On I, I'm going to, to group them in two big families. So one is would be what I call part-based, which is just that uh, you would look for your object by uh, detecting individual discriminating parts, like uh, arms or eyes or whatever. And then to have, uh, usually the underlying model, it's some kind of uh, condition in, in uh, independence of the parts given a certain reference point. But in practice, algorithmically, it gives you an algorithm for which you find parts and all the parts will do some kind of half transform, so voting for what is the center consistent with me. So if you detect an arm here, you would say, okay, there is the guy is either, either here or here. Now you detect this, this arm and this arm is going to say, okay, the guy is either here or here. You get two votes here, you say, okay, the object is here. And you have a bunch of uh, methods which are getting more and more sophisticated and works usually pretty well uh, based on this, this idea. And then you have what I would call monolithic model, which is just uh, what I described before. So you, you go through the poses and you use brute force machine learning and you ask again and again the question. So you have the, the uh, one of the first methods for uh, face detection, which was based on the uh, model of the density of face images with a PC and mixture of Gaussians. Then you have the famous convolutional networks, which have been uh, existing for like you know, 20 years and, and works pretty well. And you have the four faces, the famous uh, cascade of uh, classifiers built by boosting. Okay, so what I'm going to, uh, my, the, the talk is in two big parts. One is uh, the new idea of stationary features, which is a way to fix the main weakness of the uh, cost to find technique I, I talked about. And the second part is really cat detection, so an application of this uh, technique. Okay, so to, to formalize a bit, um, I, I will denote uh, why the pose space. So, uh, so, so this hidden variable we want to associate to every target we detect. It's a it's, um, geometrical pose. And I'm going to split it into uh, big K subsets, which correspond to the resolution I'm interested in. I'm, I'm going to be more precise. Then I will denote uh, big I the, uh, an image, so the signal I have access to. And to the image, I will associate as, as many Boolean random variables uh, that uh, as, uh, as cells. So for every cell, I have one Boolean random variable that tells me if truly there is or not a target in this image with its pose in this uh, subset. So for instance, if I'm interested in face detection, on, uh, let's say there is no scale, so all faces are, are of same size to make things simpler, the image would be something like this, uh, a, a map of pixels. The pose of the targets are actually this uh, orange cross, a 2D C. So the pose space is uh, the actual uh, 2D rectangle, so two coordinates between uh, zero and, and the way, uh, and width and uh, zero and height. I would split it if I'm interested in, for instance, a, a resolution of, I don't know what, 32 by 32 pixels, I would split my pose space into as many cells of that size. And I would have one random variable for every cell. So for this thing, for instance, all this random variable would be 0, 0, 0, etc. But only two of them would be equal to 1. And there are the locations for which I have a target. Okay. So for faces, as I said uh, in, in the first slide, we considered uh, a 4D pose, which is just uh, the coordinate of the center of the face, the scale, so the size, and the tilt. But the problem is that cats uh, tend to be slightly more complex. So those are images uh, taken from the database we use. 
and they tend to have an extremely uh, an extremely uh, uh, large variation in, in the pose. So it goes from okay, you, you, <laughs> you can see by yourself. So what we propose is just to add one more parameter compared to the to the face uh, to explore this. Now we are in the process of making it even more complex, but for now, and during the rest of the talk, the pose will be a 5D uh, vector, which is just center of the head, UHPH, so this point, radius of the head, so the diameter or the radius of this circle, and then the location of the what I, I would call the belly, which is uh, roughly the center of mass of the body of the cat. Okay. So for every cat, there is every cat visible in an image, there is this ground truth, uh, a 5D pose parameter. Yes. Training, uh, your training data will be annotated. Yes. Annotated. Yes. Painfully annotated with this, with this data. Uh, so now, if uh, still abstractly, so if we if we forget the precise uh, example I'm, I just described, if uh, you you are given a training set which is a bunch of images, and for each of them, this uh, long Boolean vector that tells you where the targets are. What you are eventually interested in is to build for every k a predictor that tells you is there in this image a target whose pose is in y k, yes or no. So predicting this uh, random boolean. Uh, by and the, the interesting point is that if you have no additional knowledge about how the signal interacts with the pose on this complex interaction, the best you could do would be uh, for every image you you would have to train one uh, classifier for every k, and so for, so for every image, you would have one sample, which is of class 0 is if there is no target with the pose into yk, and the other one if there is a target with yk. But so to make it more concrete, if you, of course, this looks stupid, because you have a strong ID opinion about the fact that uh, the, target is, uh, the appearance of a target is translation invariant. So if something looks like a face at some point of the image, if it's somewhere else and still looks the same, it should st you should still be able, able to say, so this is a target. But you have to realize that it's because you have a strong understanding of the relation between the pose space. So here there is a k for face between the, the location and scale of the face and what it means in terms of pixels. But if you don't have this knowledge, if you don't model this, the best you could do is if you want to detect if there are faces here in scenes, you would, you would take one million scenes. And for every of them, say, okay, if, the, if you have a face here, it's of class one. If you don't, if, if there is a face but somewhere else, it would be of class zero. And then you would train one, classi one classifier for this location, and you would train another classifier for another location, etc. It looks stupid to say it that way, but it's actually what you would do if the pose, uh, the relation between the pose space and the image uh, space is not obvious. So if, for instance, I, I have a bunch of images which are extremely well uh, scaled and, and centered, but now you have only one remaining parameter, which is uh, angle out of the plan. Usually what people do, they retrain one classifier for the small domain of angles. They, 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 don't, they don't do what they do for translation, which is to find a way to, to get rid of this problem. So in practice, if you have k pose cells, and you have no idea of the relation between the signal and the, and the pose, what you can only do is basically to have one sample for every scene and you divide the number of positive examples by the number of pulse cells. So of course people don't do this uh, for face detection. So if I, I denote uh, xi uh, feature vector, uh, what usually people do is that they introduce a way to normalize the signal, which is uh, if you give me a pulse cell on an image, I can produce a new image so that if now I compute my features in this new image, and there was a target initially at this pose, then it does not depend with the pose. Okay, practically, what does this mean? It means that uh, you, you are able, if I, if I give you a bunch of images with, with faces all over the place, you are able to bring them to a reference pose, so that if you compute now your feature after this normalization, it does not depend anymore with where was the target before this normalization. So it, we denote it that way, and it just means you bring in a reference pose, in a reference pose cell, all your training examples, okay? So you can do this. If you have a way to normalize the signal, given a pose cell where yeah, there is a target, you can bring your target into a kind of reference uh, frame, uh, you can do this. If you can do this, then what you can do is to train uh, one detector with this new uh, data set, which is for every scene and every pose, 
I normalize my signal, so I'm going to compute my features in, in, in the image after normalization, and I will associate a label which depends with what their target initially had disposed or not. So it's really like I give you a scene, you go to every pose, you bring it back to a, a reference frame, and here, if there was initially a face, it could be of class one, either or it would be of class zero. So this is nice because now you keep uh, really a lot of sample, and you keep especially all your positive examples. And now you would train one guy with this one classifier. And now, if I want to predict if there is a target in in, in scene I at, with a pose in uh, pose cell K, I will first normalize my signal according to this pose and compute the response of my classifier there. Okay. So if I want to predict if there is a face here, I first move my my image to normalize this pose, and then I compute the response of my classifier in my reference frame. So the problem is that uh, evaluating this size, this normalization of the signal, is computationally intensive for any non-trivial transformation. So if, if, if you are talking about translation, you would not really move the pixels. You would move your operator. For scale, also, you can do something. So if, you are, if we are talking about how wavelets, for instance, you, you, you don't need really to downscale the picture at the, at, the, at the bitmap level. You can just change your operator and compute it analytically, like if you had done the transformation. But now if you are talking about rotations, if you are talking about nonlinear deformations, if you are talking about uh, multi-parts and you want to take uh, many things into account, you can't do this that way. And actually, it's, it's even uh, worse than that, because you often Psi does not exist. So if you consider a cat, for instance, I if you look at a lot of cat pictures, or if you have a cat at home, you will realize that the statistic of the he pose head is pretty independent with the statistic of the body. So the cat is always basically looking at you, and the body can be wherever. Uh, so it's typically this, this, this kind of thing. And so if I'm normalizing the signal with rotation, translation, whatever, I have no way to, to put uh, some parameters relative to the body to force them into a certain reference frame without changing the head. So it's basically what I would like to, to do. I would like to not touch the head, so not damage my features that are specific, specific to the head location. And still, I would like to maybe normalize the body location and extract features specific to the body in this uh, reference. And in practice, uh, fragmentation, so this phenomenon that I talked about, which is to, to split my training set into uh, uh, some uh, subsamples of more uh, homogeneous pose, is the norm to deal with any problem which is not translation or scale. Pe even for in the plan rotation of, uh, for phase detection, they tend to, the usual way is to split your training set into uh, 20 training sets corresponding to sub-angular sub, sub, uh, domain. And then you train as many classifiers. So to summarize all this with a, 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 a nice looking uh, commutative <coughs> diagram, this can be, this can uh, formalize uh, the normalization of the signal. So you give me a pose or a pose cell on the signal. I first normalize the signal, then I extract the feature. I end up there. And then from this, I'm going to compute a classifier. What we propose, which is pretty simple, is to directly index the features. So instead of trying to find an intermediate representation, you give me the pose, you give me the signal, and I directly compute my feature vector. So it, it's not really uh, so extraordinary, but it's just to, to, to be conscious that it's what you usually do. So if you do phase detection with R wavelets, you never compute R wavelets on an image. You always compute R wavelets on an image for a certain pose. It's, it's what is uh, in all the uh, phase detector algorithms. You actually, if you look at the code, you will end up looking for how wavelets in a certain, for a certain pose of the target. So in practice, what we call a family of pose index features is a mapping from the uh, family of pose cells times the uh, image space into uh, R to the power n with the, with the following property, which is that whatever the uh, initial pose cell, whatever the value you're looking at, the priority for your features to have this value, given that there was a target in the pose. So if you evaluate your features at for a certain pose cell, given that there was a target at this pose cell, it does not depend with the pose cell, which again is obvious if you think about translation on scale. If, if you take one million images with faces at a, with in each of them a face at this pose, and you compute your feature vector there for this pose, you obtain a certain distribution. And then you take another million of images with 
faces with a face in every single of them at another pose, and you compute your features in this uh, on those new images for this pose. The histogram should be exactly the same. You if you are able to guess where was the target initially, it means that you precisely are not invariant to what you would like to be invariant to. So we call stationary features a mapping from post cell time image to Rn such that the distribution on a certain pose, given that there was a target at that pose, does not depend with the pose. Okay. So, for instance, if my objects were a pair of scissors, the pose could be, for instance, so six, six points, so the tips on the center. And if I index the, way, where the location where in the scale where I'm going to extract my, for instance, a linear response with, those, with this pose, so that when it moves around, I'm going to scale, rotate, translate according to the pose, it's obvious that if I give you the response of the filter, which is adapted the way I just said on those three locations, you have no way to bring back the poses where uh, they were evaluated because I precisely designed the pose index features so that it's not the case. Another example of pose index features, which uh, is more formal but may help to understand exactly what we mean. Imagine that I built a uh, uh, synthetic 1D signal, which is a pose, so my 1D signal would be di of dimension uh, 32. My, the hidden pose is just uh, Two, two numbers, two, integer, two integers, uh, which uh, are so theta 1, theta 2, theta 1 strictly uh, smaller than theta 2. And the signal is uh, between theta 1 and theta 2, a, a normal low, independent normal low, which is centered uh, on 1, and everywhere else centered on 0. And imagine that now uh, I say that my pose index features, if you give me the pose on the, on the signal, is going to be this 4D vector, which is the value of the signal just before theta 1, the value of the signal at theta 1, the value of the signal at theta 2, and the value of the signal just after theta 2. This thing if you com is, is, obvi is obviously of this distribution, so the, val the value of the first, uh, the first dimension of this uh, pose index features, ve feature vector would be the Gaussian center on 0, the second one is Gaussian center on 1, center go the Gaussian center on 1, and Gaussian center on 0. This thing does not depend with the pose anymore. So it, it's, it's pretty trivial stuff. We oppose index features, you evaluate it for a certain pose on a certain image, and if there was a target, it does not depend with the pose. So now, if you give me such uh, a, pose index, a set of uh, pose index features, family of pose index features, now I can build the training set, which is for every scene on every pose, every pose cell, I'm going to have a sample, which is a vector of Rn, which is a response of the pose index features at that pose. Uh, comma, the actual uh, Boolean uh, label, which is where there a target there or not. Okay? And from this, we can learn a single classifier and do the trick as for the normalization of the signal. Now, if you tell me, is there a target whose pose is in uh, pose cell K in image I, I'm going to first extract my pose, compute my pose index features for that pose in that signal, and then compute my classifier. Okay, so practically, uh, all this is super template uh, matching. I just, everything I said is just a way to do this heavy machine learning thing on top of features that can be dedicated on the fly to an abstract pose, okay? And we keep in mind that all this artillery is just, uh, just to, to open or the doors to more sophisticated poses than just uh, uh, scale location on the maybe orientation. Okay, so now we apply this to, to cat detection, which was the original, motiv or original motivation. So here I'm just going to describe first base features, uh, what do I call base features, which, has, which are not pose indexed, which are basic signal processing, and then I will show how we, we uh, parameterize them with the pose to have, to some extent, the property of uh, invariance I was talking about. So the first thing we do is to extract at every point uh, eight different edge detectors, so we use extremely crude edge detectors. We, for instance, we would say that there is an horizontal edge at this point, so the big dot, if the difference between the two pixels which are connected by the thick line is greater than the, the six others. That makes sense. If you have a gap here, if you have a jump here, and not here, not here, not here, not here, not here, then you would say there is an edge. So we just use this criterion on that every point we have now eight Boolean flags, and we do this at, at three scales. So Typically in this image, this is the response of the things I showed. So you have two horizontal edge detectors, two vertical with polarity, uh, dark to light, light to dark, and two diagonal. Then you have a coarser scale, and a even coarser scale, we divide by, uh, with some sample by a factor of two. 
Okay, so now at every point I have 24 uh, flags corresponding to energy vectors. And from this, uh, we define what we call base features. So base features are not pose indexed yet, they are just function of the image. So the first kind is the proportion of a certain edge. So orientation, this, is, this can take eight values on this case, can take three values in a certain window. So it's really like you give me a grayscale image, uh, my, my features is parameterized by a window on a certain orientation on scale. So I go through my window and count how many pixels have this edge. The second kind of feature are parameterized by two windows on the scale, and it's just the L1 norm between the uh, orientation histograms estimated on the two rectangles. So basically, the first kind of um, feature are able to catch in a really coarse way uh, contours and silhouettes. If you have a, a big border, a big uh, vertical line, even extremely noisy, the system would be able to put a rectangle on count where have enough uh, vertical uh, edge. The second kind, by looking at the difference between the orientation histogram, is able to compare textures. Is the texture there similar to the texture here? And the third kind compares the gray levels, the gray level histograms between two windows. Okay, so this just look for is able to catch super edges. This is able to compare texture with strong invariance to illumination. This is able to compare texture or color with uh, with uh, invariance made to scale, but not to illumination. Yes. We come to this. Actually, this is maybe the central question. <laughs> so, but it's the next slide, so the timing is perfect. So now, if how do I index the, the windows with respect to the pose to have this uh, miraculous um, pose index uh, feature family? So this is the actual pose of those cats. This is the ground truth. And from this, we define three reference poses. A reference frame, sorry. So one of the frame is a head frame. It's a, a square centered on scaling with a head, on, head location on scale. The second one is a body frame, which is centered on the belly, that, which is in the ground too, so on this point. And of size twice, the, uh, four times the head size. And the third frame is centered on the middle point between the head point, the head center, and the belly and is oriented uh, according to this orientation. So bottom line is, if I have a pose, or if I have a pose cell, I take the average point in the pose cell. And from this, I define a three reference frame. And now, what we do is simply to let the features, to make the feature stationary, we associate to every window a flag that tells us in which frame it's defined. So every one of the windows, the base features, can, can decide during training if it, if it wants to be relative to the head frame, belly, belly frame, or head belly frame. So for instance, here we see the first, actually it's the first picked in the learning um, uh, pose index features, which is comparing the grayscale histogram between two windows, and both windows are attached to the head frame. Okay, so when the cat is moving around, it's still attached to, attached to the head frame. It's really similar to what you do for uh, face detection. Second, another kind of uh, uh, pose index features would be this one, which is comparing the texture between this part and this part, and both are attached to the body. So it makes sense. It's just looking if uh, the, the, and actually, it, okay, it, the, the frames are polarized uh, uh, correctly. So if the head is on the left, the reference frames are uh, switched. So when, you, when you say attached to the body, is, so there is a, the body is specified by this point. Yes. Yes. Okay, if, if you want uh, the details, so it's really like uh, you really, so you have your reference frame, which is centered on the belly location on the size of size, like eight times the head radius. And now you define your window by saying this coordinate minus one, two plus one, minus one, two plus one, what is the s where is the center of the window? And you define both the width and the height of the window with respect to the size of the square. So if the square moves, it translates. If it scales, so it scales accordingly. So the windows are in that frame. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And then you have the, the third example, which is maybe shows the real interest of those. This is in that case, you are comparing, the system is comparing uh, a grayscale histogram, or actually edge histogram, I don't know. Um, be estimated on a window which is attached to the head belly frame on the window which is attached to the belly frame, which is really interesting because you see that when your cat is moving around, the, the kind of semantic you could attach to this uh, question, which is, is the fur or whatever 
which is nearby the head on the body is the same as right on the body, which makes a lot of sense. It's exactly what you would like to see emerging from your system, which is to, to touch that there is a cat with its head here on its belly. Here it makes sense to look for continuity in the texture. OK, so, 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 so if, if there is only one message to, to take from all this is we just uh, parameterize usual features with the pose so that when the, when the pose moves around, the support of the features where we measure them goes moves around uh, consistently. So now we have this. Uh, sorry, yeah. It goes on very fast, so. Uh, I'm sorry. So the, the size of the windows. Yes. And uh, the, you don't rotate them, they're just rectangular. Okay, so sorry. Uh, oh, yes, yes. When you see, they yes. move around, right? Is it yes. Yes. Just to capture some translation effect, or do you also capture other oh. kinds of information, right? Because you could do all kinds of things. Yes. Yes, but now, okay, but now we are facing technical issues, which is to do this efficiently, you have to use integral image. To use integral image, you have to have only rectangles. So re rotated rectangle is not a rectangle anymore. So, so here we have. Machinery using the MS mode, the Viola Jones kind of uh, integral image. Well, I, I, it's, it's, in it's not how we've let, so it's integral image to compute, uh, to compute histograms. But uh, so to minimize the effect of not rotating them, when they are uh, in a reference frame that can rotate, we force them to be square. Because this, I don't, I have no way to compute this efficiently. Okay. So, so this becomes more a practical. Yes, yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. But what we do actually, and th that may be of importance, is that we also let the learning decide if the edge detectors themselves have to be rotated. So, if uh, a, a feature is attached to the head belly frame. The system can decide, OK, and I want the edge detector to rotate. So the quantification in 8 would go around with the. Uh, so you, get, you capture the rotation effect. It's only the support. It's kind of rectangular. But we force it to be, if it can rotate, if it should rotate, if we, if computationally we had a way to rotate it, and we can't, we force it to be square. Because a rotated square is closest to a square, and a rotated rectangle is close to a rectangle. Uh, OK, so uh, now, we have so the now we have this way. Uh, we have this bunch of features uh, that we can evaluate on the pose. And we have this training uh, set, which is scenes with pose and labels. And we train. So what is interesting is now the, the, the this G classifier G has no idea of all this mess. It's just a usual uh, classifier that takes this vector of responses from the pi features and just predict uh, a value. So what we do is to do, we, we are pretty heavy here, so we do uh, and okay, and we put all this uh, in the in the uh, framework, of course, to find. So we have we first uh, constrain the the head pose, and then we constrain the body pose. I will come back to this later. But basically, the classifier we use have two thousand five hundred stumps, so it's a usual thresholding of uh, features that we train with. Uh, okay, I should not say vanilla Adaboost, but Adaboost, and we introduce two things uh, which may help. Which is that instead of doing the cascade stuff at Avira Jones, which is, I th it seems, and I think, pretty hard to tune because you have to choose how many weak learners in every level, what are the thresholds, and, and it's pretty complex. We just uh, substitute these to, we, we do usual boosting. So I don't know if you are familiar with the cascade thing, but the idea is to do bootstrapping. So you, you build the first classifier, uh, and then you, you are going to build the next stage by just taking the false positive that goes through the first level. And it's a way to concentrate your classifier more and more on the difficult popula negative population. So in your image space, you have your small positive population, a uh, lot of uh, negative examples on the negative population. And the really tricky ones are the ones which are close to your positive uh, population. And in practice, if you sample, you never catch them. So you train the first classifier, then you take the false positive this first to build the second, etc., etc. And what is uh, unpleasant in this scheme is that it's basically doing what boosting is supposed to do, which is to focus on the difficult example. So in that case, uh, we avoid the cascade by doing boosting on to handle it, to be able to handle one million negative examples. What we do is weighting by sampling, which uh, is extremely efficient computationally. So every one, to give technical details, every 100 steps of boosting, we resample 10,000 negative examples according to the boosting weight. So we keep the response of the classifier up to date on 1 million negative examples. But when we pick a weak learner, we based our choice only on 10,000 negative examples, which are sampled among the 1 million. And we also. But to be fair, I just yes, yes, yes.
Yes, 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 okay, so exactly. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes, exactly. So we, we address this also. The yeah, but, but you agree those are two ways. Uh, and I, want yeah. I do not want to sound like I'm. I'm uh, yes, 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 yes. No, no. And I, I'm, uh, I think all the, the, the core ingredients are in the cascade. We are just like. Uh, but so for the computational part, we, we put a threshold every 100 stamps. But so in, in we keep the response. And I think also it makes a, a bit more sense instead of having classifiers that don't talk to each other. We just have, it's like we have a, a one classifier with 2,500 stamps, but now we choose one threshold every 100 stamps so that the overall error, error rate is uh, our target error rate. And when we have the cascade effect, basically we stop on an easy rejected uh, examples, we stop early. And so for the experiment I'm going to show, we have a total of 2,300 scenes containing 1,700 uh, 1, cats, and we use 75% for training. So we do 10 rounds of cross-validation to have uh, kind of uh, significant results. And uh, we use actually 50% to choose a weak learner, 25 to pick the threshold, and then 25 to test. OK, we have a, a bunch of experiments that I am not going to detail here that just show, because we wanted to motivate really on to, to to back up a bit our claims about this uh, the pro problem of doing full exploration without the cost to find or to, uh, to, sp to fragment the data. And we can show extremely easily that if you don't, um, if you fragment your data, so if you build a bunch of classifiers dedicated to subpopulations, uh, it's, it's terrible. It does not work. And if you do it uh, naively, brute force, without a, a, course, uh, a cost to find structure, it's also untractable. OK, so the message is that stationary features avoid fragmentation as much as possible. So as long as uh, if you're able to design features, so if, if it makes sense to put the samples together, which means that there is a way to get rid of the pose, there is a way to normalize uh, feature response with respect to the pose, it's the best you can do. Um, you so it, it, limit, it limits the fragmentation as much as possible. And then second point, so this deals with the fragmentation. And the second point for the, for the uh, computational cost of the exploration is the hierarchical search concentrates computation where it is needed. And even, uh, even more than cascade in that case, because you can really, uh, if you wanted to have accuracy for the pose, and if you wanted to do this with cascade, then you have a problem because you, you at the end, you would end up doing hierarchical things. OK, and we call the resulting approach a folded hierarchy of classifiers. Why? Because during training, it's like we are folding all the, if you remember this, uh, this hierarchy, the scheme of the hierarchy, all the cells of a certain level are bring together, and then you train one classifier for this. And during tests, if I want to pass a scene, I do the opposite. Now I'm going to kind of virtually have one classifier. I expand my classifiers analytically, uh, one for every cell. So to connect with the course to find, we use here a simply a two-level hierarchy. With uh, you have a first level that so our pose space is 5D with three dimensions for the head, two dimensions for the body. And what we do in the first level of the hierarchy, the cells are tiny cells for the head. So the we explore the scales with interval with 15 intervals between 25 radius 25 to radius 200. And for every interval on the scale, we split the scene into, we split the location into small pieces. So in the first level of the hierarchy, a pose cell is a small pose for the head times the full space for the body. And when you go to the second level, you keep your head cell, but now you split your body pose space into 500 uh, cells. So the head level is composed of 50,000 cells. And then for every one uh, of those, we have 500 uh, body cells. So maybe to make it clearer, this of course, it's denser than this, because we have 50,000 uh, head cells. But you can see that way we first explore all the head locations. So we explore all the, those 50,000 cells, run a classifier for every cell that reacts. We go to the subcells. So for every cell that reacts, in that case, let's say we have three of them, we go to the subcells of this of this uh, head cell, so which practically, for the, case of the, for the case of the cats, correspond to exploring possible body locations. And for every body location, we have a, so here I show the centroids of the cells. For every body location, we run, again, a second level classifier. OK. So for the results to estimate error rates, we have to define an uh, error criterion. So if the true cell is the black one, so this, this, this guy, we would say that an estimated cell is an estimated pose is correct if 
the estimated head location is at less than the head radius from the true head location, and if the estimated body location is at less than twice the head radius from the true body location. So this would be counted as correct, this would be counted as incorrect, incorrect, and incorrect. This is pretty demanding, because uh, often, even visually, you would think that the detection is correct, and actually the system would count it as uh, incorrect. Want to have a, so a, kind of a, a kind of a baseline to at least see what the really the pose index features uh, bring in the story, uh, because we have all this artillery with uh, with a lot of weak learners and all those things and things. We propose uh, a baseline which is composed also of two levels, so still the cost to find approach, but instead of letting the the second level use pose index features that can look at the head, uh, they can only look at the bodies, which means. Uh, this detector formally corresponds to first running a head detector, then running a body detector, and every time there is a, a co-occurrence between the heat, we would say, okay, there is a cat there. On the, so th we call this H plus B, because we have head detector plus a body detector. And then we have a really the HB, which is our stuff, so it's the same, but now the second level can really ex exploit the, f the full uh, interest of having this joint pose between the head and the body. So if we compare the two, so the result can, be, can look uh, uh, weaker than what you can get for phase detection with frontal for frontal phase, de phase detection. But first, we are looking for the body, and this is extremely difficult compared to just looking for the head. Uh, and also, this is not frontal cat head. This is not even uh, registered in rotation. They can be all over the place. So if we catch 70% of the cat, we have basically alpha, alpha false error, alpha false alarms per scene. And as you will see, all the false, almost all the false alarms we get are on the cat body. So it seems that the system had finally designed automatically a pretty well cat texture detector. And it can be fooled by uh, cat texture, but not by carpets on the on buildings. So if we compare the performance, so this is the f uh, average number of false alarms per scene on a log scale. This is the true positive rate with the criterion described, as you can see, basically the pose index features divide the false alarm by three at, a, at any true. So you would say if you, uh, if you, if you tested on, on images where there are no cats, then you would get the number of false alarms would be smaller on the... I think so. I think so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I also tried, I don't have the result here, I tried classification. So instead of trying to guess the location, on the result where something like if with true positive 80%, there would be 5% false positives. So I ca we can show, uh, actually, so here are results picked uniformly. I, I have to insist on this. I did not cherry picked <laughs> the results. So I just r run, run round, uh, pick one round so that the threshold is fixed for 70% true positive, and just picked a bunch of images at random. So as you can see, uh, the post okay, there is of course a post-processing of the alarms, but the post-processing is not too aggressive, which means that even if there is a strong response, we don't discard all the all the other alarms which are inconsistent with it because this it's it's better visually to give a talk. It would be the best way to go, but then it hurts you for the work because you it happens often that the good one is is weaker than uh, a better one anyway. So this, I think, is kind of correct. There is no false negative, and I don't know if this is counted as false positive. I don't think so. This is correct. This is correct with one false positive, because there's a big alarm, uh, which is not uh, correct. This is correct. No, uh, no cat, no, no alarm. This is correct, 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 correct. Well, maybe this, is, no, uh, maybe this is counted as incorrect. I don't know, because I think the center of the body was here. Correct, correct, etc. But as you can see, we don't put any constraint on the head orientation. The head orientation does whatever it wants. It can be oriented, it can be non-frontal. Uh, and as you can see, when you have images, empty images, even difficult ones, because I don't know if you have ever done face detection, but this kind of images or this kind of uh, this kind of images is really difficult for uh, object detectors because you have plenty of edges, so it's extremely easy to have false positives. Okay, so uh, conclusion: the what I just showed uh, can be seen as a super template matching, which is we we are exploring um, exhaustively in some sense the pose space, and for every possible pose, we are asking the system: is the target there? 
but it's super template matching in the sense that uh, the way we organize it allows us to do it quickly because of the cost of fine organization of the computation and allows us to bring the, the machine learning methods of choice. We could do this with SVM, decision trees, whatever, uh, because at some point we have a feature vector and we just have to make prediction from this. So it has the benefits of template matching, black box machine learning, and hierarchical search. However, this is achieved at the expense of annotating the training samples with range ground truths. We are not doing this in a totally automatic way. Uh, so now we are thinking about uh, either using some EM procedure, but more specifically, I'm working with a student who is trying to do this from uh, videos. So we, we would have a fixed background, show an object, and try to guess automatically both the pose space and the annotation in the image. And also, you have to design the pose index features, which, is, which may be an engineering challenge. But I, I tend to believe that this is far easier than uh, designing real invariants. There is a really, uh, it's, it, it's pretty difficult if I tell you, OK, I would like you to measure something on this image so that if the image moves around, uh, your, the response remains the same and still is informative. It's not like a constant stuff. This is far more difficult than I want to design a piece of algorithm so that if there is a target at the pose, I know the pose of the target, I just need to build something where when I measure the thing on the target and I know where it is, then the response is consistent. This is far easier to do. So this because there is this marginalization that you, this sum over some hidden state that you must have when you build an invariant, you don't have to take care uh, at this level. It's, it's taken care of at the level of the big hierarchy. So this exploration of the hidden, uh, hidden value. OK, so the references, we have a paper, a GMLR paper uh, coming out soon. So we send the camera ID like one month and, one month and a half ago. So it should uh, be there. And everything I showed, so all the code and uh, all the data are available uh, on this uh, website. So the code is under GPL3. and. Uh, OK, it's pretty heavy because each round takes something like two days and a half on a powerful PC and we need 20 rounds to plot the rock curve I showed. But you just have to run one script. And you are at Google, so you are not afraid of having computers. And you just run one script and everything should run uh, without a glitch. So please, if you're interested, in if there is problem, send me a feedback. I would be more than interested. And uh, okay, I would like to thank the people from Rate My Kitten. So this is a website where people can submit cat images or rate other people cat cuteness. And those, those guys gave us uh, 120,000 uh, cat images. So we have uh, plenty of data to, to work on. Okay, thanks for your attention.